the wrong time to go fishing. The wrong time to go fishing. We're going to pick up John chapter 21, verse number 2, if you will. John 21, verse number 2. It says this, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I, I go a fishing. They said unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth. They entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught nothing. Uh, on the surface as we look and we read these couple verses, it seems like a good thing, doesn't it? It's a, it's a group of friends, close friends. Maybe they were sitting around a table. Maybe they were shooting the breeze and as they conversed and talked there. Or maybe they were walking down the road there and uh, there in the town and, and they were just talking and, and maybe going over things. All of a sudden one of them, that is Peter, he speaks up and he simply says this, I'm, I'm going to go fishing. And you can imagine Nathaniel and, and uh, uh, the other disciples there, James and John, the other two disciples, and, and Thomas, they, they kind of, they, they look at each other and like kind of probably look at each other, nod their head, they're kind of in agreement, yeah, I, we'll go with you, we'll go with you. So they head down to that lake, and what's called the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, and likely a, maybe a family member or somebody had a couple boats, and uh, they go out, they get on the boats, and uh, uh, they head off into the lake for a night of fishing. Sounds like fun. Just a group of friends that doing something together with their time. But as it often is, there is much more to the story. You see... These seven men were not the only companions on the boats that night. Peter had actually brought a couple other companions with him. In fact, they were companions he didn't want, he didn't invite, and yet they were there nonetheless. In fact, over the past several days, they had never left Peter's side. More so than those other six men, these, these companions were his constant companions over these days. Couldn't just get away from them. What were the companions that, uh, that really dogged his steps? They were simply this. Number one, they were regret. And number two, there was bitterness of soul and spirit. Bitterness of soul and spirit. Peter would come to find out, as maybe you and I have found out in life, that regret is a tiresome and can be a, a debilitating companion. Likewise, as we think of bitterness of soul and spirit, it's that sorrow that is pictured well as a broken heart. It is a wearisome companion. Both are right there. They were Peter's constant companions. In fact, as we will see here in a moment, it is, it is likely, it is the reason that he went fishing in this moment. I might ask you today, pun intended, are you in the same boat? Has regret been dogging your footsteps? No matter where you go, you experience bitterness of soul and spirit over things in the past. The question might be, how did, how did Peter get here? How did things go so wrong that as we jump into John chapter 21, we find him wallowing in regret and this bitterness of soul and spirit in, the, in a boat in the middle of the night? To answer how Peter got here, we must begin back in verse number 1. If you will, look with me there. It says this, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the sea of, excuse me, at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. I would key in and focus in on those first three words. Because those first three words simply refer to the greatest day in the history of all mankind. After these events, it refers to that day that impacted mankind like no other. It refers to the, the things that transpired in the days ahead. It refers to the things that transpired in the days afterwards, after these events. In fact, we know the story well. Jesus had entered Jerusalem triumphantly. People had come out to worship him and praise him like no other time on earth before that. But then the religious leaders desired and sought to persecute him, to kill him. And so he was betrayed, and he had been interrogated, he had been tortured, he had been persecuted, he had been beaten and battered, he had been ridiculed, mocked, pierced, and then hung on a tree to die. And all the city, it seemed, came out to revile him. And he had died. And the world would never be the same. 
He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was mourned by friends and family and followers. And yet, he arose the third day. And he revealed himself to those who loved him dearly, even appearing to the disciples who had forsaken him in the garden, along with others that had gathered with them in the days after his death. And as you take all of this into account, as you and I come to John chapter 21, and we read these, these three little words, after these events, it sums up all that they had gone through. And may I just remind you, as you and I have just done a quick synopsis, literally, as it, uh, we think of the greatest day of my the fact is this, it had been a roller coaster of emotion. A lifetime of experiences and memories crammed into a week. You ever have a week like that? Where there's just so much going on and so much has happened. It's been a, a roller a coaster of emotions. And maybe when it's a loved one died or something has transpired or you got difficult health news or whatever the case. For them, this, this week seemed like years. It was a lifetime of experiences wrapped all into this. But for Peter... Really, his thoughts pushed everything else to the side except one little part of the story that is recorded for you and I in Luke chapter 22. Turn with me there, if you will, Luke chapter 22. Just a few pages back to our left, Luke chapter 22. Look at verse 54, if you will, with me. Luke 22 and verse 54. Notice what it says. We'll read down through verse 62. Then they took, uh, then took they him, him being Jesus Christ, and they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off, verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I, I know not, I know him not. And after a while, uh, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately... While he yet spake, the cock crew. For 61, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Then in verse 62. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, could you imagine what transpired after this? As he left that place, no doubt he stayed alone for some time. He found a quiet place where he indeed, as the Bible would put it, he wept bitterly. Fact is, he was probably too ashamed to speak of it to many people. Likelihood, he didn't go run into James and John and say, hey, you won't believe what I just did. No, this goes much deeper and this is much harder on him, much more of a broken heart. And so he would have kept himself. And the days afterwards, probably, certainly as Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he talked with his disciples and others, no, no doubt Jesus Christ would not have mentioned it. He, he would not have spread it to the others. Oh, don't worry. Peter felt like you did in a, in a, in a grand fashion. He, <laughs> he denied me three times. Christ wouldn't have done that. He wouldn't have spread that news. See, it is likely that Peter alone knew of his denial of Christ. In his own heart, he had failed. Man, this is his own personal betrayal of Jesus Christ. In such a failure, such a sin had become a source in his life of the immobilizing, debilitating regret that was his constant companion. It caused that deep sorrow, that bitterness of soul and spirit uh, that paralyzed him, that broken heart that Peter was living with. As we jump into John chapter 21, we find a very broken Peter. We find a very disheartened Peter. We find a, a Peter who, who feels like he has let his God down in the greatest way possible. And there's nothing but regrets and there's nothing but bitterness of soul and spirit left to him. Last verse really does say it all. And Peter went out, and I know it's talking physically, he left that place, but I'll tell you right now, Peter felt like he had already turned his back on God, so why stay there? 
I had already turned my back on my Savior. And so he walks away in a sense from Christ. Because he felt and knew he was so undeserving. He wept bitterly. I would submit to you, I think it's clear from the passages and the accounts that we have, that Peter was broken. He was ashamed. He was disappointed in himself. He was hurting. He had sinned. And he knew it. He had failed his Lord in the one way that he had promised. Lord, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go with you to death. The very same way he denied his Savior. If we're honest this morning, I dare say we all have to admit that we've been there. We all failed our Lord at some point in our lives. We've all stumbled and failed. We've sinned against him like Peter, like David, like the other saints and disciples and followers and believers, even recorded in the gospel for us and his word. The Bible's pretty clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that if we have no sin, we do what? We deceive ourselves. Literally, we lie to ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So today, you and I can face and entertain these same two companions of regret and bitterness of soul because of our failures. So we think back through our lives and we think back to choices and decisions we've made and sins we've committed. It would be easy for us to allow true regret and this bitterness of soul and spirit to do to us what it did to Peter. You see, the fact is, that's not unnatural for regret and that bitterness of soul spirit to be present. Because the reality is this, if we're truly repentant of our sin, as I believe Peter was, and we'll see it here in a moment, if our sin is, truly breaks our heart as it breaks our Savior's heart, two things will be there. We'll regret it immediately. How many of us have sinned? Maybe this week, maybe this month, you've sinned. You've done something that you know is against God's word and his commands. And boy, regret fills your heart. Regret fills your soul. Because you know you'd let your Savior down. And then when you think about the consequences of that sin, that that ill word spoken, that that anger uncontrolled, that that wrong thought nailed your Savior to the cross. If you truly love him, then your heart and soul will be filled with bitterness. Why did I do that? I know that was wrong. I know that wasn't right. I, I know I shouldn't have done it. That bitterness of soul and spirit can spread. We can be just like Peter. And I don't know about you, but I think the hardest part of reading this little story of Peter, this little episode in his life, was verse number 61, isn't it? And the Lord turned, and he looked upon Peter. You ever been caught with your hand in the cookie jar? You ever been caught doing something wrong by your parents or maybe your grandparents if you're a young person here? You ever been caught doing wrong? You ever, been, you ever see red and blue lights in your rearview mirror? You, you, ever, you ever something ever catch you and you, man, you got dead to rights? As Christ turned in the midst of going through everything he was facing and he looks upon Peter. Could you imagine the heart of Peter in that moment? Here's what I've often thought. What if it were possible, and God made it possible, every time you and I sinned this past week, this past month, that the heavens opened up, and you and I, in that moment, after we had sinned, we could see the very face of Christ look down from heaven and look upon us. What would we feel? Now, the reality is, it is enough to know that God knows everything. It is enough to know that my sin, no matter how I might think it insignificant, no matter how I might dismiss it, that sin nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. It cost him. That is enough. Not, not to take you and I having Christ look down from heaven. So the question is this, how do we respond in the moment? And I would submit to you this morning that as we sin, and we will and we have, and there are things in our life that we have regrets over, there are things in our life when the memory of the thought comes back to, we have bitterness of soul and spirit, no doubt for most of us, if not all of us. 
where we have failed our Lord, much like Peter did. And so in this, Peter is a good example, but Peter is also a, a good example of what not to do. So he's a good example of what to do, but he's also a good example of what not to do. What you see in the scriptures this morning, this simple thought, number one, when you and I sin and fail our Lord, we should be like Peter in this. Be honest, broken, repentant, and serious about our sin. Be honest, broken, repentant, and serious about our sin. I don't think that any of us can argue that as Peter went out in that private place, he, he was alone, he wept bitterly, that he wasn't broken and repentant. That look that Christ had given him brought what? The Bible says it brought all the words that Jesus Christ had said to him. Peter had boastfully, pridefully said, hey, I'll never leave you, though I'll forsake you, Christ, I'll, I'll follow you to death. And that's when Jesus Christ had said, listen, Peter, before that cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Oh, no way. That, that's not going to happen. I'll never fail in that way. I'll never sin in that way. Sure enough, as we just read, it happened. Just as Christ had prophesied. And as it did, he was confronted, he was convicted with sin. He knew he had messed up. Yet, even in that moment, as verse 62 tells us, he was honest with himself. That's where we must start. Being honest with ourselves, You see, he didn't go out there and as he was walking away from that area and walking away from Christ. He, he, he didn't say this. Well, you know what? That denial of Christ, it, it wasn't that bad. Boy, I could have done that a lot worse. As we sometimes do with our sin. He didn't go away from this. Well, you know, really, it was just once. I mean, yeah, I did it three times, but it was all at the same time. So it just counts at once. And it was just a minor slip up. It was just a, a little something. It's not that big of a deal. It was, just a, it was just one time. And we dismiss it. He didn't do that. Though I believe he was tempted, I do not think Peter did this. <laughs> well, at least I lasted that long. All those other disciples, they, they gave up at the garden. At least I followed him into the palace and the, uh, the house there. And at least I was with him longer than anybody else. So that has to count for something. Boy, it's funny how we try to vindicate and explain our way our sin, isn't it? But how often we do. Well, at least I didn't do that. I'm not a murderer. At least I didn't do that. I'm not that. I'm not this. I'm, I'm not so-and-so. I didn't do it like them. Peter doesn't do any of that. He didn't excuse his sin. He didn't, he didn't compare, by comparison, elevate his as not being that bad. He simply admitted his sin and failure. We'd have to say by what we read here and also what we see later in John chapter 1 that happened at the shore of the lake. He was honest, he was broken, he was repentant, and he was serious about his sin. And so it begs the question of you and I this morning, are we that serious about our sin? Have we handled the sin in our lives that way? Oh, it may not be in the same uh, grandeur as Peter as recorded in Luke chapter 22, but nonetheless, our sin is no different than Peter's sin. When we disobey, when we fail to do what we know to do is right, or what we know is right to do, we sin. Could I ask you this morning, have you faced your past sin with honesty and brokenness and repentance and seriousness? I dare say that some regret, some bitterness of soul and spirit is actually there because we have never truly repented and forsaken of our sin. Sin has that baggage. So have you done so? Have you been honest? Have you been broken, repentant, and serious about your sin? Or do you dismiss them? small they're unimportant they're not that big of a deal do you explain them away through um, denial and comparison do you stop short of being broken and repentant over your sin here's where peter did not falter here's where peter's a great example he he, he, had, uh, he was honest about his sin man i messed up this is terrible and you can see by his departure his weeping bitterly his heart was broken over his sin as it ought to be for all of us but now the focus of this sermon and the rest of our morning, we will focus and look on the example 
of what not to do given to us by Peter. You see, Peter wasn't fishing that day. This didn't happen because, ah, just a hobby. It's just something for him to do. He didn't do it because it was the right thing to do, but rather he was lost in his regret and bitterness of soul and spirit. He's literally debilitated by that regret and bitterness of spirit. He's a great reminder of this truth. Number one, do as he did. Be honest, be broken, repentant, serious about your sin. But number two, he reminds us of this truth. Don't let regret and bitterness of soul and spirit sideline you. Don't let regret and bitterness of soul and spirit sideline you. Regret can have great futility. I wonder if in your life, as there is in mine, maybe there's something from our past that brings us great shame. It may be to others very small. It, it may be a sin that, is, that happens every day in some people's lives. It, it may be a choice. It, it may be a decision of the past that led you down the wrong path. It, it may be any of things, and big or small, that we probably hide from others that, like Peter, we don't want them to know about. We, we don't want people to have any idea because it embarrasses us. We regret it. And many of us would wish, man, if I could just go back in time, if I could just do that all over again, I, I would change that. And, and it, it can be all kinds of things. It can be when you were a young person and you fell into sin in one way or the other. Maybe it was just a, a word unfitly spoken to a friend or a family member and that just hurt the relationship. Maybe as a parent you failed in some way and you think, man, if I could just go back and if I could just fix this. And boy, it just beats you up. The regret is there. The bitterness of soul and spirit. Maybe it's a child and you've said something to a parent. And boy, you wish you could take it back, but you can't. And that regret and the bitterness is present. We hope that time will remove the regret, the, the bitterness of soul uh, over that sin. But it doesn't do that for everything. The minds are both a wonderful and terrible thing, aren't they? Memories. The ability to recall. See, the thought of that sin, that failure pops up every so often. And as it does, the regret and the sorrow come right back. Could you imagine what it was like in those days afterward for Peter? Every time he woke up in the middle of the night, all he could think about was Christ's face. All he could see was Jesus Christ looking at him. All he could think was, I failed him. I failed him. I am a failure. I can't do anything. I can't accomplish anything. How, is, how am I ever going to look him in the eyes again? That bitterness of soul and spirit. For some, the bite of regret, the bitterness of soul and spirit never goes away. And unfortunately, sometimes that regret, sometimes that sorrow, that broken heart, it sidelines us. In this race we call the Christian life. Feel like we cannot do anything for God now. We feel like everything we do is, is a sham. It's a, it's a fake. Uh, we're hypocrites. And surely God can never bless our endeavors for him. And though, though we have repented. And though we have uh, forsaken that sin. And we have asked for forgiveness. Though we have done all those things. It still is there. And often it is Satan behind us. And so what do we do? We, like Peter, we hang up the sign in our spiritual lives. What does it say? Go on fishing. Gone fishing. What does fishing symbolize? What did it mean for Peter? What was the fishing all about? Well, you see, fishing for Peter was simply this. It represented life going back to his way. It represented living without Christ at the center. It represented wallowing in self-guilt. It pictured Peter pulling back from God what God wanted him. In simple terms, it was Peter giving up. I'll go back to my old life. I know fishing. At least I can do that well. I'm a, I'm a failure as a follower of Christ. I'm a, I'm a failure as one of the 12 disciples. And I, I, what could God ever do with me again? I, I have failed miserably. And so he goes back to the old life. And as such, I just tell you, it was truly the wrong time to go fishing. And Jesus will come, as we read in verse 1. Jesus is going to come, and he is going to instruct Peter. In fact, I would put it this way. 
as Peter was sidelined there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. As his life had came to a screeching halt because of regret and bitterness of soul and spirit, Jesus Christ would come and he would do the work of restoration in the life of Peter. Because a life of regret is not how God wants you and I to live. You and I are created in Christ, a new creature, not to live a life of regret or full of bitterness of soul and spirit, but you and I are supposed to live this life unto him. So Christ comes, and we would speak into Peter's life several truths. We don't have the time to, to get into the, the whole gamut of here, John chapter 21. But I would encourage you by three things that God comes to Peter and shows him. And maybe this morning the Holy Spirit would speak to you and says, listen, regret and bitterness of soul and spirit has sidelined you. So would you listen to the voice of your Savior today? Here's what he said to Peter. Number one, he says this, you can still love me and live for me today, even though you have failed me in the past. And Peter needed to hear that. We need to hear that. Maybe this week spiritually wasn't great. Maybe you fell, you and I fell on our face. Maybe we struggled with the sin. And boy, we walked in this morning and it's like, man, I, I just feel like I am a failure. I have failed miserably. And boy, regret and bitterness of soul and spirit are there. And as Peter saw Christ and Christ calls him to the shore and he fixes him food, Christ begins to elaborate and as he exchanges feed my sheep with uh, lovest thou me feed my sheep with with peter he is he is expressing to peter these truths peter yes you failed me and i've seen your heart and you are broken you're repentant you have forsaken it does not mean you cannot love me and serve me today and i don't know about you but i sure am thankful for a forgiving savior You can love me and serve me today in spite of the sins of the past. Number two, you know what else he says to him? He says this. Peter, I still have plans for you. You still have a role to play in my great plan. So get off the sidelines and serve me. Peter, you love me? Feed my sheep. Get off the sidelines. Don't let regret and bitterness, take care of your sin rightfully. Just don't dismiss it, throw it on the rug. Repent of it. Be broken over your sin. Forsake it. Come to me for forgiveness. But when you do, get off the sideline and serve me. Because I still have a plan for you. And there's a role for you to play. Maybe today the, Christian, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in that way, Christian. Number three, here's what else he says. He says this, you need only come back to me when sin separates you from me. Because I am always ready to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'm always ready. When you and I commit sin, when we falter, we fail, we struggle, we let down our Savior, he is always ready for you and I to come back to him. One of those disciples with Peter that night. One of his close friends who was there, he was uh, there in the streets or sitting at the table when Peter spoke up and said, hey, I want to go fishing. And he joined in with the others. Oh, I'll go with you. He was there with Peter in the boats that night. He, he was there all night. And I don't know about you, but when I go fishing, I want to catch something. And they sure didn't. He was there all night with them. He was there when, when Peter, uh, they, they, they saw Christ on the shore, and he asked, have you caught anything? And, and I don't know, one of them probably said, can you not see that the, sh the, the boat is empty? <laughs> it's empty! And then they realized who it was, and Peter jumps off, and he swims to shore, and the rest of them bring the boats in after he tells them to uh, cast on the other side, all those good things. But he was there. He was also there around that fire, and, and Christ had prepared the food, and he fed them. He was there. And it's very possible that he was also there when he heard Jesus Christ look at Peter and says, Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. He was there during this entire restoration process. He was there when he realized, and, and maybe it came to light, that eh, somewhere that, that Peter had failed him and turned their back on him like the rest of the disciples certainly did in the gardens. 
and this companion of Peter. He would later put into words how regret can be let go of. How bitterness of soul and spirit over repented of sin can be swallowed up with the love of God. Here's what this observer said who was there that night with Peter. He wrote for you and I, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I've often thought, did, did John think about both his and the other disciples as they came back to Christ and how they had denied him, they fled from him, they had forsaken him, and then Peter there uh, and all he had gone through on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus Christ embraces them with love and forgiveness and restoration. I often think if this verse brought those memories back to mind, Brent. Confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, John certainly knew that when we confess that sin, we forsake it, we repent of it before him. He promises to forgive us of the transgression, that failure, that deed. He also says, I'll cleanse you of it. And when he does so, he washes away all the shame, the guilt, the sidelining regret, the bitterness of soul and spirit. You know, I have found out that there are people in this world, there are people who, who like to throw our mistakes, our failures, our sins in our face, even after they've forgiven us, even after, after they've told us, hey, I'm over that. But God doesn't. When God says, I forgive you, my friend, he forgives you. As far as the east is from the west, so have I removed thy transgressions from thee. You see, we cannot allow the regret and bitterness of soul and spirit over past, repented of, forgiven sins keep us from what God created us in Christ to do today. Are you sidelined this morning? Is there regret and bitterness of soul and spirit over past sins, over things, choices made that have sanguined you? You see, these memories must serve not as an open door for regret and the sorrow that sign and light us, but they ought to be energizing reminders of what God has done for, for our sins. I don't know about you, but I sure am thankful that today I stand forgiven, cleansed, and a vessel ready for the master's use. Are you there today? Because I'll tell you right now, if you've made bad choices and bad decisions in your past, it's the wrong time to go fishing. No Christian who has repented of, forsaken, been forgiven of their sins ought to go fishing, be sidelined. You ought to be serving your Lord. You ought to take to heart everything that Christ has said to Peter in this passage and others. Number one, be honest, broken, repentant, and serious about our sin. Because I'll tell you right now, if you have sin in your life that is unrepentant of, that, that you have not owned up to, there ought to be regret. There ought to be bitterness of soul and spirit that brings you to come to him and employ 1 John 1, 9. So be honest about it. Number two. Don't let regret and bitterness of soul and spirit sideline you. And would you remember these truths this morning? You can still, as Christ would say them to us, you would still love me and live for me today, even though you failed me in the past. You still have a role to play in God's great plan. So get off the sideline. Serve him. And last but not least, you need only come back to the Lord when sin separates you from him. Because he's always ready to forgive and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. May I simply ask you this morning, are you fishing? Are you fishing? Are you in a place where you honestly need to come before God in an old-fashioned altar there at your pew and say, Father, there's some sins in my life. I haven't asked for forgiveness, so let me start there. Maybe the others, there's some things of the past Satan just throws in your face time and time and time again and there's too much in your life where you've been sidelined. There's too many things where you've just left off serving God. And God wants to have a moment with you on the shore of the Sea of Galilee like he did with Peter. He wants to tell you these truths. Would you embrace them this morning? Would you allow God both only, not only to forgive you, 
but would you allow God to use you going forward? Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the encouragement.